Anybody got a question for any of the panel at this stage? Well, while, while you're thinking, I might uh, ask Peter first. Um, one on corporate farms, uh, cor yes, cor sorry, uh, corporate run um, farms. You talked about the lack of skin in the game. Um, what are the ways of getting a bit more of the sort of Gordon Gecko greed type skin in the game? Or was that you? Oh, beg your pardon. Okay, That's all David, right. sorry. Uh, um, I think there's two things. I think, I think David pointed out there is no one right or wrong uh, model. Um, the thing is, is uh, there's, a, there's a, a shades of grey with regards to how these models will work. I think one of the things about what we look at with, with our farming relationships is we, we take a very simple principle. Corporates are good at raising money. Farmers are good at farming. So we're pretty simple. So we say, well, if the corporates do that and the farmers farm, our job is to bring the two together. Just disintermediation. Banks do it all the time. So why can't we do it with investment? Um, it's a little bit more complicated than that and actually making it happen. And that's what we've spent the last two or three years doing. But it's re really that simple. We get the people who are good at doing what they're good at, doing it. And then what you can do is create optional exit strategy, which allows that farmer then to buy back the farm of the corporate, giving them the ability to change over to exit with their cash, so getting that cash flow which they need, but allowing the farmer over a 15 year period to actually have a farm. So they're not reliant on the family for capital. Do either of you want to add to that? Yeah, I, I think there's, uh, there's a few ways to get skin in the game. Um, our fee structure is a large component of it is based on uh, performance. So if you don't perform, you don't get a substantial proportion of your fee structure. So it's pretty strong alignment and pretty strong incentive. So our fixed component tends to cover our cost and our profit is only made when the investor makes a profit. Um, Co-investment, I think, is increasingly expected and quite reasonably. So the manager putting in some skin in the game alongside the investor to the extent that they're able to do so. I think is another important way. And is that happening more and more? Yep. Right. Yep. I think uh, if, if you're uh, trying to raise capital and you don't have some capital yourself to invest alongside, it, it's, it's another box that they want to tick. Well, I do have one for Peter now, uh, which is on um, some of the, your data looking at how influential the capital land appreciation was. Mm -hmm. Now. When you are an investor and looking at what is wrong with looking at total returns and how should investors see capital appreciation of agri agricultural land going forward? Well, there's nothing wrong with thinking about capital appreciation and every sensible investor would. I think you, you just need to understand what's happened to the price of farmland and that the increase we've seen has pretty much been in a period from about 2002 through to 2009 or 2007, and since then it hasn't done much. So um, it's great if you have land before that or you get in early, but you, you need to understand what's driving that. And, and that's no simple task, because if you look at what's happened to, um, to operating returns over that time, uh, it's, it doesn't seem to be correlated at all with the changes in the land price. Um, so there's, some, there's something else going on. So um, it's 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 risky, it's, and it and it seems to be just as risky as the operating side um, of the business. Mm -hmm. So really, in terms of improving uh, farm performance, uh, the best thing to do is focus on what you can focus on, which is the operational side. Well, I think it's exactly what David was saying at the end: is you, you have to you have to buy well, and then you have to manage well. So if if you if you pay too much then um, you've paid too much forever and it's going to be hard to get a good return and once you've got it you need to manage it well because um, I think as we heard this morning there, there's, there's plenty of other people around the world improving their productivity and, keeping, and they're getting their cost down uh, and we need to be doing that as well. Mm. Uh, anyone else up there? No? Not for a moment? Yes? Yes, sorry. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm the Kate that David referred to before. Hopefully I'm not one of the bad ones. Good on you, Kate. Uh, Kate Burke from uh, Think Agri. My question is, uh, would, would the panel care to comment on the opportunity that uh, outside investment brings to the 
uh, members of family farms that don't actually get the opportunity to farm on, the, uh, on their place of birth. So they want to be family farmers that uh, don't actually inherit the farm. So, sorry, just to, I don't quite understand that. So you're talking about foreign investment giving opportunities to... Oh, no, not foreign investment, or, but, or but just investment. institutional or, or investment per se, giving opportunities to people that want to farm but may not have access to the family farm. But, but they have a proposal in mind? Or, or just the skills. So the, there might be four people who grew up on a farm, two people end up farming that farm, then mm -hmm. there's another two people with a passion for agriculture that want to be part of the industry. Stephen, can I pass that one to you? What would, if, you if they rocked up at your bank, what would you say? Oh, I actually, this, we, I was at Warrnambool Field Days, um, or Sungold Field Days at Warrnambool about two weeks ago, and we, were t we had um, a classic example of that scenario. Um, we, we were talking to uh, two um, young people. They were actually 23, just married. Um, the, um, the the uh, the wife had um, was an accountant, just finished uni, passionate, um, I think fourth or fifth generation dairy farmer. Um, the husband um, he was just passionate at getting in and getting involved and loved the farming, um, but they ha had nothing to start with. So um, it was very clear to. Um, a larger institutional um, business down in that area that these people had what it takes. So they actually provided the opportunity um, and give them some land um, to farm. And then they've set up an arrangement where um, they share the returns over a certain amount of years. They've allowed also um, the, um, the young farmers to be able to um, start to um, build their own herd um, so that's a classic example. So you're seeing more and more of it. Mm. Because, as I said earlier, the, um, the institutional um, organisations really are valuing the quality of the farming techniques and the, you know, the passion of our farmers. So it's how they bring that into their circle, mm. but then how do they give back the other way? So it was a classic young farmer. Brilliant. Brief, Dad. Yeah. Yep. Uh, I think we've got to separate people having careers in agriculture from owning farms, you know, it's, a, it's this, we're in a bind if we think to be a farmer, you've got to own the land. And, and one of the advantages of outside capital is it gives career paths for good young people to come into agriculture and they don't need to own land to have a good career. Yes, but I'm very sad about that. <laughs> because, I mean, from an emotive point of view, if you, if you come from a family farm, the thing that you want, if you've got the skills, is to go out and one day have your own family farm. So you're saying that really, we need to just move on from well, all that. That's fantastic if you can do it. Mm. The, the reality is agriculture is a capital intensive business. Mm. So you need cap to be capitalised with five or ten million dollars before you start. Yes. Unless you're going to share milk or something like that, which has got good models. And, and no one has the right to suddenly get five or ten million dollars in any other sector of the economy. And so, twas, it, twas ever thus, I suspect, anyway. Uh, it twas ever thus. And, and to think that we need to foster a model where we want to bring young farmers in and give them cheap loans and all that sort of thing is totally ridiculous because it's, it's about running businesses competitively and generating the returns. And, right. and, and it's, you know, it's very well to be emotive about it, and that's fine. I get emotive about my farm that was sold and I didn't get a chance to buy back. But so be it. My parents made that decision. Righto. Yes, sir. Uh, Graham Peart, an agricultural consultant. A question to David Cornish. Uh, but the comment is that there are only three ways to get a family farm. Matrimony, patrimony or parsimony. And it hasn't changed in 3,000 years. David, you talked about uh, the coefficient of variation and the cost of variability of income in agriculture. Uh, which I'm very sensitive to having analysed and helped farmers through a lot of crises. I asked a man when I started consulting, tell me about the bankrupts in our district. And he said, I can think of quite a few cattle bankrupts, but I can't think of a single sheep bankrupt. It's about the variability of income and the high costs of drought and the variable costs of cattle. You talked about the Central West 
as having uh, the lower, uh, the sheep wheat zone as having the lowest variability. But my observation in the trends is that family farms cope quite well with mixed farms, but corporates don't cope very well with mixed farms, and yet to swing with the punches in a mixed farming can be very profitable if you can do it well. Would you like to comment? Uh, the short answer is yes to all your points. Um, <laughs> The, 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 it's, it's fascinating dealing with, especially overseas investors, that the concept of a mixed farm is, is, is they just, they can't handle it. They, it's just like um, we, we dealt with some Germans and we, when they were saying, well, listen, we want, we want a meat, sheep meat operation, I said, yeah, well, we can do that, but what I'd like to do is look at a mixed farm. No, we will not look at mixed farm. We want a sheep. It, it just, it just, they just cannot handle it. For some reason, I don't know why, but I think that has a lot to do with not understanding how it is to farm in Australian agriculture. But with the other points about this whole question of mixed farming, managing risk, um, again, there's a lot of work being done with the Grain and Graze group looking at that, uh, which would support y y your major premise. Now, again, I don't know why corporates struggle. Um, and I'm saying that without actually having the facts, but that would be my presumption as well. But I'm happy to be proven wrong. Yeah. Um, yes, please, Phil. I think the other in interesting issue is uh, a lot of institutional investors are very aware of headline risk. And they seem to be very averse to things with tails, as they describe them. And uh, they don't like animals because they perceive higher risk in terms of welfare or something like that. So they're, some of them I would describe as nearly paranoid about having animals on their farm. So it's a real challenge to convince them that it's a good thing to do when they're, all they're worried about is being a small target. Not, notwithstanding the, the protein challenge. Yeah, they'd rather say, we'll grow the grain to feed the, feed the cattle to sell to Asia rather than right. grow the cattle. I have one last one before we go. Anybody else got one? Um, it's about supermarkets, and you're talking about uh, the focus on lower costs, lower costs, and that we, must, we must get back to that. To what extent have supermarkets driven that in farming? Is it therefore a good thing, and are we going to see a lot more from it, uh, more of it from the farmer's point of view? Um, I, I think it's inevitable because we, we're in a global marketplace. So we can have Coles and Woolies putting us under pressure, and they do, and that's quite reasonable because farmers are the worst when you go into the local reseller to buy a drum of Roundup of screwing the price down. So it's in everybody's business model to do that. And, and so if we don't take that view on that we've got to achieve productivity in order to keep our cost per unit down, not necessarily our cost, but our cost per unit down, then we will be left behind. So we're on a treadmill and we have to accept that and just tread faster. I, I anyway. I want to contradict your premise a little bit through personal experience in that working with Coles and Woolies, especially in the goat cheese operation, has been the best thing to happen to us with regards to increasing sale and increasing our profit margins and working with a, a supermarket or retailer that actually gives us feedback. Um, so from a personal perspective, I can't speak more highly of the supermarkets. Where the price pressure comes from is, is our competitors, which is the beef and sheep or French goat farmers. But did, did working with them actually and, and getting feedback from them help with your efficiencies? Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and they also invested in it in helping it. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Terrific. Well, on, on that front, um, thank you all for listening to four very different takes on, on this space, I think, um, and uh, look forward to catching up hopefully at dinner this evening. But uh, David, Stephen, David and Peter, thank you very much for joining us.